Good morning. Um, <clears throat> welcome back to Physics 4C Lab. Uh, today's lab, we're going to be looking at the gravitational constant. Now, you might think, hey, the gravitational constant doesn't that belong back in Physics 4A. But it turns out that uh, we're now looking at uh, the chapter on astrophysics, and uh, the gravitational constant becomes one of the most, if not absolutely the most, uh, important constant in determining properties of the universe at large. You know, what are going to be the rates of expansion in the universe, and how will stars and galaxies form. So the gravitational constant is absolutely fundamental uh, for astrophysics, and uh, we're going to take a look at it. So uh, the way we're going to be measuring this gravitational constant, it sounds kind of crazy. Back when we did do gravitation in Physics 4A, we talked about, well, everything attracts everything else gravitationally. It's just that it's typically a really small force, and we just it's not measurable. So if you had two everyday kind of objects, you know, a kilogram here, a kilogram here, and you set them near each other or farther away, we could figure out how much force there is attracting those two objects. Well, that's actually what we're going to do in this lab. We're going to get, now it's not as large as this, we've, uh, I've got a, um, I have some video that uh, was taken in the um, physics uh, lab room at Laney, so I'll be able to play that in, as, as part of this. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to suspend uh, a couple of masses, they're, they're fairly small, they're like 20 grams each, uh, these little spheres, uh, and they're attached with a connector, a piece of aluminum here, and then there's a, a torsional uh, string or wire, so a very, very thin metal wire. In fact, it's so thin I, I keep breaking these. Um, fortunately, we have some spares that we can connect back up. So, um, there's a very thin wire here. And that says that if we create just a little bit of torque, if we uh, attract, for example, if we take another mass and we place it close to this one, it's going to get attracted, and then I place a mass on the other side of that one. What we're going to tend to do is rotate this uh, setup, and then we're going to call this our, our rotor with the two masses on either side. Um, and uh, what that will do is it will rotate it ever so slightly. But it turns out it's actually measurable, just with, again, objects that, well, these guys are only about 20 grams each, and then we've got some other uh, lead spheres that are um, about 1,500 grams each. Um, now, uh, the lead is for the density, and uh, they're safe because they have this sealant that's, uh, that's coated over the outside, and they're used exclusively for this lab. Uh, what we can do then is we can start asking questions about, well, what's the behavior going to look like of this thing when it begins to oscillate? Is it going to get drawn to a new equilibrium point when we place some masses close by? Or is it going to oscillate back and forth? And the answer is, it's going to oscillate back and forth. If we really want to wait until it settles down at a new equilibrium point, it could be hours and hours and hours or even days, until the oscillations settle down enough. And meanwhile, we would have to keep the lab room uh, completely motionless, you know, make sure none of the bar trains go by. Uh, so it's not practical to be able to have this thing settle right down at the equilibrium point. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use what we did learn back in Physics 4A about damped oscillations. So uh, the wire is going to have a, a, a stiffness constant, a, a k value. Uh, this time it's going to be a torsional constant, a uh, little k, in the wire. And we're going to end up with oscillations of a certain frequency. So the oscillation frequency squared is given by the torsional constant divided by the rotational inertia. Now I hope some of this is vaguely familiar. Uh, it's been a while since Physics 4A. But the rotational inertia for these, um, for these point objects is what we're treating them like, that are separated by distance d. Each one of those would have a rotational inertia of md squared. And uh, so we're going to get 2md squared for the rotational inertia. Now, uh, what that says then is we can determine, we can do a measurement 
of how much stiffness is in this torsional wire by uh, looking at the periods of oscillation. If we look at the period of oscillation, that will enable us to go in and, and get the, the uh, rotational frequency in, in terms of radians per second. And uh, we can plug that into the formula here. Omega is given by 2 pi over the period. Uh, the rotational inertia is 2md squared. So that gives us a formula where uh, if we measure m and we measure d, and we got values for those, so we'll talk about some of these um, uh, measurements that we've already got in place uh, going into the lab. Um, so we have these values to work from. The only thing really missing here uh, is going to be um, the period of oscillation. So we will, you know, we'll get the objects and get a mass value for them. We'll get some, uh, some uh, rulers out and, and get this distance measured too. Now also what's going to happen is that there's a, there's a time constant, uh, the gamma factor right here, that tells us the rate at which these oscillations damp out. And it actually turns out that it's important for us that it's not a, a frictionless free or a damping free oscillation. It's actually for the purposes of the lab we're also going to need to know the rate at which the oscillations drop off. The amplitude of the oscillations will be dropping off. And so, uh, anyway, that's just... Uh, and uh, the period of oscillations here is probably going to be at least several minutes. So, um, you know, it could be as much as five or, or ten minutes or so uh, just for one oscillation to take place. This is not something that's oscillating back and forth very quickly. Uh, so we do have to stay still during those times, take a seat, sit quietly, watch the oscillations. Now it's kind of, gonna, it's, it's, it's got some similarities to the uh, speed of light lab that we also did uh, earlier this semester in that it's just one setup for the whole class. And so we'll get this thing set up in uh, on one of the benches, and we're going to use the board at the front. Let's take a look and see what this is all going to look like. And so, uh, this was a side view. Now, I tried to draw this so you can kind of see this thing's going to oscillate back and forth in a horizontal plane. Uh, <clears throat> now, what we're doing is a top view. So, we're, if we're up above the apparatus here, and here are these two 20 gram uh, spheres that we've got, uh, this thing is going to oscillate back and forth uh, depending on whether we put uh, other objects, other masses, close to them. So what we'll do is we'll place a mass here, we'll place a mass here, and that will tend to turn it in this direction. That's going to rotate this ever so slightly. And then over here on the, uh, at the front of the classroom, along the whiteboard there, uh, what we're going to do is wash the oscillations back and forth around the new equilibrium point. So we're going to say, you know, if everything settled down, the equilibrium would be pointing towards this location on the board. When we place uh, the masses here and here, it's going to twist just a little bit, and the oscillations will now be around a different equilibrium point here. Uh, when we reverse the masses, so we can reverse them so they're in an opposite direction, um, the uh, oscillations will then shift to a different equilibrium. We need, we need to measure this distance. This distance will enable us to figure out how much the, uh, the two masses, the rotors, uh, rotated, how much they twisted the wire uh, for each of those settings. Now, built in to the uh, rotor is a converging mirror. The converging mirror, it's, it's small. We've got a laser set up here. And what we're going to do is take laser light uh, coming off of uh, the mirror, and that's going to bring us out to um, this point on the screen. So we're imagining if this rotates a little bit, um, we're going to end up with the light at point B instead of point O, and if we rotate it the other way a bit, it's going to end up at A. Now the converging mirror has a focal length of two meters, um, so we're going to place the laser three meters out, and what that gives us, I hope this works, check the object and image distances and the focal length, see if it satisfies our formula. See, we need it to be in physics 4C, 
uh, in order to do the optics on this lab. Um, and then the length to the, um, to the front of the room from the uh, setup is going to be six meters. So we're going to have this thing set six meters back away from the board and um, we will be able to then get a focused uh, laser image. If you remember, we did kind of the same thing with the speed of light. We had a converging lens set up so that uh, the returning light signal would become a point. Uh, it would be easy to see where it's located. We're going to use the same approach here. So kind of the same idea. Okay, again, this is a top view. Now, here's, here's, here are these masses. Here are these objects we said we were going to bring in. We're going to do is we're going to bring in these 1,520 gram objects and place them a distance r away from each of these masses. That's going to set up, amazingly enough, a gravitational force. So it's a tiny gravitational force that was not there before. And what that's going to do is rotate these masses just a little bit. Here is the uh, wire coming out of the board right there. That's got a torsional constant on it. The lever distances here are d, and the distance center to center between these two spheres, um, <clears throat> these two mass spheres, uh, is going to be r. Now this is the direction towards the screen. With the masses here, we would get a little bit of rotation here, and if you go back to that slide before, we would have a new equilibrium position at point A. Then, uh, the way the setup works is we can pretty quickly switch these. These are placed on a rotating uh, support. And that rotating support, we can move them pretty quickly so that they take on this configuration. And uh, now the forces are going to be in this direction. And we're going to uh, rotate, the, the rotor is going to turn this way, and then we're going to be uh, sending the light out to that equilibrium position on the board at point B. So that's the idea uh, for the setups for point B, setups for uh, equilibrium at point A. Now, uh, let's run some formulas here and see what's going on. Uh, here's that uh, setup again. So let's do this. Let's say that on each side we've got a force of gravity that's given by big G. That's what we're trying to measure in today's lab. So we got a big G, we got the two masses, the product, and we have to measure R. So we're looking pretty good there. Uh, we can set these on the scales and get some mass measurements. We can uh, get out a ruler and measure R. Uh, we just need to find out how much force there is. Now, the way we're going to come up with the force is by measuring how much torque is generated on each side. So we're going to take this side. Here's our axis of rotation is the string coming down from above. That's going to have a lever distance of D and a force of F. That says the torque generated on each side. Remember, we got two of these things going on. The torque generated on each side is going to be given by F times D. Uh, now, at equilibrium, the torques should balance out. And by balance out, what we're saying is the torque due to the string, which would be K times theta, where theta is the angle that the string has rotated through, uh, is going to be equal to two of these torques. 2 times F times D would be the torques coming from both sides. So, pretty straightforward, I hope. Now, there's a bunch of details in this lab. There's a bunch of, like, factors of two that you have to pay attention to. Uh, we just saw one of them there, right? Uh, are we looking at the torque on one side or the torque on both sides? Well, here's another factor of, a couple factors of two we got to keep track of. So, here's the front of the classroom with the whiteboard. Here's the screen. Uh, you know, we're going to be measuring these oscillations as the uh, point of light moves back and forth along the screen. We'll get a, a meter stick up there, a two meter stick up there. And uh, kind of our goal here is to measure the distance between these two equilibrium points. So what we can do is we can shift the masses to one configuration and let it oscillate around A. Now there is a way that we're going to be able to go in and, and measure 
the amplitudes of oscillation and actually determine where the uh, equilibrium point is. Okay, and over on this side, uh, the uh, again we'll, we'll we'll be able to measure what the equilibrium points uh, location is over there. Um, <clears throat> all right, if I've got a laser and it's sending light out here, but this is now shifted by an angle theta. Where is the light going to show up on the screen, on the board? And the light is going to be shifted by an angle of 2 theta. Because if this now, if this arrow right here is showing the orientation of the rotor, the rotor has moved by an angle theta, well, the light's going to be incident at an angle theta, and it's going to reflect at an angle theta, that's 2 theta. So we got to keep track of that factor of 2. Now eventually what we want to do is to be able to go in and we said um, determine what theta is equal to and we can get it from this formula. Uh, the distance between the two equilibrium points um, is going to be given by uh, 6 meters, the length, times the angular separation, and the angular separation is going to be for thetas. Now the angles here are really small. It turns out that when we run this experiment, uh, the amount of shift, the, the values of theta that we observe, are less than half a degree. So in, in some sense that's kind of remarkable. We've got this gravitational force actually creating this half degree shift. Um, but uh, the, the angles are so small that we can use the small angle approximation. Um, and, and that's what we're assuming in these formulas. So um, most of the formulas here are going to be assuming that, the small angles. Okay, so let's see what formulas we have right now. Uh, we've got uh, <clears throat> flipping around the gravitational formula. We can say that the gravitational force constant is F times that distance R squared uh, over M times M. And F is going to be measurable from taking K times theta and dividing by 2 times D. Now the masses, uh, these have been measured, 15-20 uh, grams and the small mass is 20 grams. R has been measured at 4.75 centimeters and D is at 5.00 centimeters and L uh, is going to be at 6 meters. So those are the numbers that we want to be able to work from. So looking at these two formulas up here, it's kind of like, well, let's see if I can get K and theta determined, I already know what D is, I can solve for F, and if I can get F solved, I can plug it in here and it's done, right? So the formulas are pretty straightforward so far. Um, here is the two meter stick attached to the uh, whiteboard at the front of the room. So we'll get a two meter stick attached up there, <clears throat> and then we'll be able to watch the light move back and forth, oscillate back and forth on the screen. So when we've got the masses in uh, configuration A, there will be oscillations back and forth here. And then when we rotate the masses into, into configuration B, then the oscillations will be here. Uh, now, as we said, uh, there's going to be damping that takes place. Actually, it would be great if there were no damping, right? Because then we could just look at the amplitudes and take the halfway point and say that's the center. But there is damping, so we're going to have to deal with the damping that um, takes place. So uh, T here is the period of the oscillations. Oh, 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 that's the, um, that's the other part here, right? Yeah, so uh, we're going to get K from the period of oscillations. We talked about that on the earlier uh, slide. And then theta is going to come from that previous slide where we looked at the um, distance along the board that we've identified from point A to point B, that's going to be given by S over 4L, and uh, that's, we can get theta. So we'll get theta in radians, measured from, uh, uh, or calculated from this, and the only items we need then is we need to know the period of oscillations, and we need to know the distance between the uh, two equilibrium points. So that's, that's what we're after. Okay, uh, the damped oscillations. How are we going to deal with the fact that the oscillations are not 
maintaining the same amplitude, but instead the oscillations are dropping off. Now I kind of exaggerated this. The, uh, the oscillations aren't dropping off this fast. Uh, but what does happen is that uh, whenever we switch the masses, uh, we're going to set this into a new damped oscillation pattern and once we reach one of the extreme points on the board, right, so we're watching this light on the board and it goes back and forth and back and forth. So once we've switched the masses, then we can watch and see where one of those extreme points is. Now, remember at this point we don't know what x naught is. We're trying to find out what x naught is. So when we measure x1, x1 is just a point on the meter stick. So the meter stick is taped up to the board. Uh, x1 is just a point on that meter stick. And then it's going to oscillate back and forth. And when it stops, slows down and stops, we're going to get measure that uh, other extreme point. We're going to call that x2. Again, that's just the location on the meter stick. So it might be at 112.7 centimeters. You know, these are just going to be points on the meter stick that we've measured. And then we'll get a third one. Turns out a th uh, that's enough information um, to carry out the calculations that we need to. So we're going to measure values of x1, x2, and x3, and we're going to use that to calculate x0. Now, if you remember, when we looked at oscillations, again, physics 4a, uh, damped oscillations, um, what we typically assumed was that there was a linear damping constant. Now that's a reasonable approximation for what's going on here, but the damping could be more complicated. But we are making the assumption that uh, the damping effect is simply this exponential drop-off and that gamma is a constant. It's not changing. Now if that's true, if you remember homework problems that we looked at, what we found was uh, the amplitude would drop off by the same factor each cycle. In fact, each half cycle, what you could do is you could take this distance, for example, uh, and then this distance and this distance. If this distance was, say, 75% of that one, then this one would be 75% of that. That these uh, amplitudes are dropping off um, it, with, with a fixed ratio. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make use of that ratio uh, from uh, each one of these cycles. Every time uh, a, a certain amount of time goes by, we drop off by the same factor. So x0 minus x1 would be this distance. So if this is x0 and I subtract off x1, uh, I intentionally set this up so that would give me a positive number. Uh, and then we're going to take a ratio of x2 to x0 so that's in the denominator. And we're going to say the ratio of this to this matches the ratio of this to this. So that would be x2 minus x0. This would be x0 over uh, minus x3. And so we've set up the ratios saying that each cycle or each, each half cycle we're dropping off by the same factor. Um, and then we're going to do some algebra. So we'll do some algebra on this. Um, and uh, you guys can take a look at the algebra on this, but you can reduce this down to x0 is equal to x1, x3 minus x2, uh, x2 over x1 minus 2, x2 plus x3. So once we've got these three numbers, we can plug those into that formula that we have right there, and that's going to give us x0. Okay, so that's, um, that's the plan. That's what we want to be able to do. So that formula right there is going to become really important for us. Uh, we need to highlight that um, formula that we're going to come back and use. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, things were going pretty well here. The formulas didn't look too difficult. Um, and we were getting set up to where we had a series of, of formulas we could work our way through and calculate big G. But of course, there are complications. So there's a couple corrections that we might want to consider making. Um, so the first uh, item that maybe many of you have noticed is that, well, wait a minute. 
if this little mass is being pulled by this big M here, isn't it being pulled by the other big M? Now, this one's farther away. We could just ignore it. But um, certainly, if there's a force over here headed towards this mass, there's another force, maybe I'll call it F prime, headed back over to the other mass. What effect is that going to have on the gravitational torque? And it looks to me like if this thing's being pulled back here, that's going to offset the torques. That's going to reduce the torque acting on our rotor. So we had only included this force and this force. We had neglected F prime, and F prime is going to reduce it. So that's, um, that's the first thing that we have to keep track of. There are going to be additional torques that we haven't taken into account. Um, now what also is going to happen, and again, this may be something that you kind of been wondering about here is, wait a minute, when this rotates, the distance r isn't r anymore, it's, it's going to be reduced. There's going to be a decrease in the distance of r. How do we account for that? Now it turns out that when we run the experiment, the amount that this actually shifts is pretty small. So it's a, it's a small effect. We'll be able to go in and estimate how significant that might be. But uh, again, if this rotor rotates just a little bit, the force here is going to get larger. So which is, what's the effect going to be? We're going to get a little more torque, a little larger force here. That's going to boost the torque. But this torque is going to tend to work in the opposite direction. So um, now you, can, you, you don't have to uh, look at all the details here. I set up a uh, force diagram. And so what I did is I allowed the rotor to rotate just a little bit. Now it's following a circular path, but over a short distance, we can approximate that by some distance x, uh, purely along the x direction. Uh, first, if you're going tangent to a circle, it's roughly going in a straight line. So for small values of, of uh, angle, uh, x will work here. Um, and so this is what our diagram looks like. So we're going to go back and say, okay, let's, let's be more careful. What are the torques do to, well, this force is still in effect, but it's going to be boosted because now instead of a distance of r, it's going to be r minus x, whatever x is. We're counting on x to be really small. Uh, and so that force is going to get increased, and that's going to have a lever distance of d just like it did before. Now this force on the diagonal, that's got two components to it. It's got an x component and it's got a y component. Now it, it turns out the x component can be written as this. So here is the force, gmm over, this is the distance using Pythagorean's theorem, and this would be like the cosine of this angle. So the cosine of that angle right there is this expression. Now this force too, the x force back opposing f, also has a lever distance of d, but then there's also now a torque here. Turns out that the y component will also contribute, and this is in the positive direction. So again, we've got f prime, which is this expression right here, uh, and this would be equivalent to the sine of theta if, again, we're working from the angle right here. But the lever distance here is small. The lever distance here would only be x. Okay. So we wrote that out, or I, I wrote this out. Uh, force times lever, force times lever, force times lever. Two components from the F prime. And um, the F primes are going to be smaller, but are they going to be negligible? So that's our, that's our formula. And even that formula uh, is approximated a bit, but it, but it should be um, accurate to terms that involve x, x over r. All right. Uh, so that can be reduced. What we just saw on the previous page, it turns out that you can calculate the torque in terms of the original force. That was the original formula, which I thought was great. Uh, times the original lever distance. Times this factor. Now, this factor should take into account all the corrections that we talked about. Now, notice that this depends on uh, r, depends on x, depends on d, now, the d values and the r values we've already written down. What is x going to be? Now, for this, you've actually got to run the experiment. But 
we're going to jump ahead and say, okay, we've been playing around with it, and uh, in our previous measurements, we're finding out that x is really small. Uh, we've been able to measure the angle and, and, and multiply by d, and that's, that's going to tell us um, what x is equal to. x turns out to be a small number, uh, like 0.38 millimeters, you know, half a millimeter or something. And plugging these numbers back in here, uh, so these are measured pretty carefully. This one's estimated. Plugging all the numbers back in, it says that the correction effect is this. Uh, whereas we used to have a torque of gmm over r squared times d, that has gone up by 1.64%, the reduced distance of r, the fact that the big M's and the little M's are a little closer to each other than they used to be uh, actually gave us a boost. Now, it's not enormous. It's only 1.6%. Uh, <clears throat> now, the other term, this one right here, is saying how much of an effect did we have due to force F prime, right? The attraction towards the other mass on the other side is going to offset the torque and uh, this one turned out to be pretty significant. 0 0.0780, well, that's 7.8%. So the torque has been reduced by about 6%. And again, this is just straight opposing uh, torque in the other direction. We got a little bit of a boost in the torque because uh, the big M's and little M's are a little closer to each other. So overall, it's a 6% effect. Um, that's probably about as accurate as we're going to be in this, in this lab anyway. Uh, so it's not um, too terribly... Well, we're going to keep the... We did a lot of work getting this, so we're going to keep uh, this correction factor, and that will show up in some uh, formulas when we get a little farther into this. Okay, so here are what the... Um, here's what the data tables are going to be looking like then. So uh, we got all those corrections taking place. Uh, taking care of. So we're going to do uh, oscillations around point A, oscillations around point B, oscillations A, oscillations B. And as I mentioned, all we got to do is just rotate those, the big M's, back and forth. Uh, when you guys take a look at the, the setup, the device, uh, you'll be able to see that. Uh, so uh, for those, we'll, we'll call this run, run number one, two, three, four. And what we need to write down are x1, x2, and x3. So these are going to be the measurements that we do off of our meter stick. And if you remember, we've got that formula. So if we go back and take a look at the formula that we had right there, we are going to be able to use the x1s, x2s, and x3s to end up with a value for our best estimate as to where the equilibrium point is located for each of the different configurations A and B. Now along the way, remember, we need to know what the period of oscillations are too. So for each of these runs, we'll, we'll do a, a period measurement. Now a period measurement... Okay, where's a period? Is the period the time between the measurement at X1 and the measurement at X2? You go, no, it's only half a period. So we'll, we'll do the measurements. We have to hit the timer. Uh, whenever we take that measurement x1, we'll hit the timer here, and then we'll let this thing oscillate all the way over, all the way back, hit the timer again, and so it's the time between x1 and x3. That's going to be the period of oscillation. And we'll get four of those, and we can average over them. So there's four set up here, and uh, then we'll just average them to get our best estimate as to the uh, period. So uh, I'm trying to get some summary tables here. There's a lot of just individual items that we do want to write down. So when you calculate uh, the x naughts, these are the x naughts. Here is the x naught at point A, and then we get an x naught at point B, and then an x naught at point A, and an x naught at point B. Now, the x A's should be measuring the same thing. We could average those. We could combine them and find out what uh, <clears throat> the average value is for these two measurements. That would become the average. There's a bar there that says average uh, value for XA. And then we can take the two XB measurements and uh, we can get an average for XB2. And you're thinking, wait, just we're just going to do a, a handful of oscillations. Remember, these oscillations are, are going to take, take 10 minutes, right? 
So 10, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, 5, 10, 15. Uh, and we got to do that four times. And we got to pay attention to everything um, while we're doing this. And we have to stay really still. So that's a long time to stay really still. Um, anyway, so once we get these two, remember S is the difference between them. So S is just going to be XB average minus XA average. That'll give us the distance between those two um, equilibrium locations. This is not a big deal. These are just the four uh, periods. I think that was on the previous slide also. Uh, we'll just average those. So we'll calculate an average period and plug that in. All right, and then there's a few more items. I, I, it'd just be interesting to see. Uh, we uh, are going to use the period information that we got from the previous slide. And using this formula, so we know everything else, we can actually find out what the torsional constant is for that wire, for that really, really, really thin metal wire. It's some alloy that you can make super thin, and it has a really tiny K value. We need a tiny K value here because gravity is not a very strong force. It's not going to create much torque. We need that wire to have a really low value of K so that it will rotate a measurable amount. Now, theta is the angle that we're going to, you know, this is going to measure through in radians, and we can get that from S over 4 times L. We saw that in a previous slide. Uh, and then it would be handy to go in and, and measure the torque. Now, the torque formula we have here is just the torque on each side, uh, so just on one of the sides, and that means that there's two of them, uh, and that says that the torque then is going to be equal to one-half. This is the torque due to the, to the wire. So the torque of the wire would be K times theta, and we're going to take one-half of that. That's going to give us the torque uh, on just one of those sides. Now, remember, there was this correction factor with the torque. So, again, I'm using one of the formulas from earlier uh, to find out how large the force is and that uh, kind of default force that we started out with. We can use that to measure G. So those are the steps. So we want to get P, uh, K sorry, uh, calculated, theta calculated, tau calculated, force on each side, and then finally G. So that's what I have listed here. And then measured, accepted, percent difference for the results table. All right, any questions on any of this? I think that takes us through everything that we need to take a look at. As I said, I've got a video of the uh, setup uh, from the lab room. And so um, I'll, I'll, I'll add that on. I will append that uh, to this uh, video. Now, um, when I was in the lab room, I wasn't as familiar with the experiment as I am now. And um, I, I, I have some of the things. I, I was trying to set up a lens, actually, to create a, a smaller um, point of light uh, and having some difficulty. And then when I went back and, and looked at the um, owner's manual, for this device, I realized the mirror already has a built-in curvature to it. You don't have to use a lens to be able to bring the um, signal to a focus. So anyway, I think that's it. So um, I will stop there with the slides, uh, and then we'll move on with uh, the uh, video from the lab room. Here is what the uh, Cavendish measurement of the gravitational constant G, here's what the apparatus actually looks like. What we've got here is, uh, if you can see, there's a very, very thin wire coming down, supporting. Now, we've got these large lead spheres. Let me move that out of the way. Because uh, what we want to see, first of all, is there's a couple of smaller... Uh, lead spheres inside that are being held up by that uh, wire. That's going to become a torsion wire. So those spheres are going to oscillate back and forth. Now, the presence of these other gravitational 
uh, spheres right here. So these have some value of m. You know, these are going to be um, like a kilogram or something. And um, let me just bring this back around to the other side. So there's two of these. Now, for the oscillation method, what we'll be doing is rotating these so that they tend to pull, uh, they tend to pull those smaller spheres uh, away from their equilibrium from the torsion string. And then what we can do is we can rotate this to a new position. What that does is it pulls those to a, a, a different equilibrium in the opposite direction, but it doesn't do it with damping. It does it uh, in a way that this is going to oscillate back and forth. So we can go through and, and uh, carry out the uh, formulas for this, and we'll take a look at the formulas behind this. But the formulas are going to predict that there's a certain ro uh, oscillatory frequency, and this is an experiment you've got to be really patient with. So the rest of this looks something like this. So that's, uh, there's going to be these very, very tiny oscillations taking place. How are we going to pick that up? Well, there is a mirror right there. If you look uh, attached to the torsion string, and then what we have set up over here is a laser. So we're going to have a laser light that is directed, and it's actually directed at it right now, it's directed towards that mirror. Now on the return path, remember that uh, torsion string is going to be oscillating back and forth. And uh, what that means is that if we follow that laser light up onto the front board, you can see it here. I'm going to go turn the lights off so you can see that uh, return laser light a little better. Here I am turning the lights off. There you go. There's the laser light on the board. And so the laser light's on the board. Uh, here is the laser. There is the light reaching the uh, torsion uh, mirror. And uh, along the way, we put a, a lens in here. Now, we haven't got that set up optimally. Um, don't know if I'm going to get back and get another chance to, to set this up. But I did set up the lens to, uh, so that the laser light wouldn't be spread too far out. But that's kind of it. That's the approach, is that we're going to be able to take this laser light and have it on the front board. Now, as this thing oscillates back and forth, that laser light on the board is going to oscillate back and forth a meter or two. And so we've got, uh, uh, hopefully, ideally, we're going to have uh, enough uh, room along that front board to be able to uh, monitor uh, the oscillation of that laser light as it goes back and forth. Okay. And so I can provide some data. The data tables will show uh, where that laser light is on the board as a function of time. All right. Okay, that's the setup.